Thank you, Olivia, for inviting us into this time of worship. Well, good morning. Dare I say welcome to December? I began that way over at Bethel Lutheran as well. Um, this morning, getting up more snow. It's kind of a surprise, isn't it? There is an unpredictability to our weather, and apparently we're getting just a little taste of winter, but hopefully soon we will return back to fall. Today is Reformation Sunday. This is the date that is chosen to celebrate, in many ways, the changes that came because of Martin Luther. Martin Luther wanted to reform the church, obviously the root of Reformation. Wanted to reform and change some of the practices, but instead, a new denomination began. It is also the history for the United Methodist Church because it began this Protestantism. And of course, we know that John Wesley had the same intent, not to leave or to start a new denomination, but to reform the Church of England. And out of the change that did not happen, Methodism was born. So a couple of things to share with you this morning, we will include them also in our prayers. Bryn Hiddle is home. What a celebration. For her to be home with her family, long journey yet to come. She can bear weight for a short period on one leg, but otherwise is in the wheelchair. And so if you go to the Facebook page or if you contact me directly, I can send you the link. We're starting a meal train. One of the hardest things when you can't stand on your feet for a long period of time is the cooking of meals for your family. I hope this is something that you can join with us as we minister, as we make her recovery and her continued therapy as successful as it can be if we can remove anything that stands in the way of that. Today we also are a community in grief with the loss of Marilyn Olson. Tuesday at Bethel Lutheran, there will be a public visitation time from 12 to 2. The celebration of life itself is family only. So today on this Reformation Sunday, it is also our continuation in our series on the Beatitudes. Today is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let us pray as we begin this service. Eternal wisdom, in the midst of all life's noise, we long to recognize your voice. Where we have been led astray by the loudest and the most visible, the power hungry and the greedy, you call us back back to your way that nourishes, back to the dreams of your prophets, back to what grounds and sustains. Today and always, may we be open to your spirit whose truth leads us home. Amen. For those of you who have the order of worship before you as we share this call to worship, please respond with me in the bold print. All that was, all that is, all that ever will be dwells in the life of God. We are inseparable from generations past and generations future. The lives of the ones who came before us are present all around us. The needs of those to come call upon us today. What are we doing with all we have inherited? the wonderful and the terrible. What will we leave behind? May God's blessing be upon us as we strive to live faithfully in the days that we have been given. Our opening hymn is O Word of God Incarnate. 
Uh, you who have the worship before you may follow along in the words, or you can sing wherever you are. A word of God incarnate. <laughs> It is very hard to follow along with these words, this old beautiful hymn, and not sing along. As we prepare for the week to come, as we prepare being in the presence of God in all that we do wherever we are, we come to times of confession. It's an opportunity. It's, it's like this. We wipe the slate because we know that God forgives. So let us pray this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment if you want to, in the silence, offer a personal prayer. Amen. So we know as we are in this series that our focus is on our verse for the day from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Then we have other scripture lessons expanding our understanding, undergirding what Jesus is teaching in the Beatitudes. We begin with Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in that holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. 
who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. And then from Isaiah 42, about the call of God in our lives. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. The words of Jesus about being a follower, a disciple. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. So once again today, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So our heart is the engine of life. A wonderful mechanism that keeps on working night and day, no matter whether we are sleeping, whether we're part of a conversation, whether we're doing something very active, whatever we're doing, it chugs on and on and on. It distributes thousands of gallons of blood throughout our body, sending out blood freshly oxygenated to replenish, returning that from which the oxygen has been depleted, continuing that same cycle over and over again. Our heart never does take a vacation. Whether we're talking about the tiny, teeny, tiny heart of a little hummingbird, or the large heart, the largest heart in the world of a whale. It is the same life-giving function of the most important muscle in our body. That is our biology. But now today, we come to these words of Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart. So is this the same heart? Or are we encountering something different? Well, today there's a few questions we need to answer. First, what exactly is this heart? that Jesus refers to. Further, what does Jesus mean when he refers to purity of heart? And finally, what does it mean to see God? Well, as we continue these reflections on the Beatitudes from this most famous sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, we begin building a fuller, understanding of the gospel as these statements fit together sequentially one after another as we began we encountered the blessings connected with being poor in spirit knowing our need for God as our recognition of that need expands we humbly realize that we can't do it ourselves we find a hungering and thirsting for the righteousness that only God can give. And as we respond to that need, we experience the mercy, the compassion of God that we are called to extend to others. Now we find ourselves on the path of feeling with others, entering into their story, hearing 
with love their story, walking in their shoes and responding to others' need, not our own. Through all of this, we now find this purity of heart which enables us to see God. Well, the Greek word here is cardia. Obviously very familiar when you think cardiac. The word we use when we talk about the heart. Every culture throughout the generations since the beginning of time has centered, has centered their understanding of life, of being a person on an internal organ the emotional, the spiritual, the mental center of a person. In our culture, we speak of the heart as that center, symbolically as the center of our emotions, our loyalties, and all of our crucial decisions. We say, I love you with my whole heart, or let's get to the heart of the matter. The biblical writers use the heart to describe the whole of a human personality, including the will and including the very character of the person. The word occurs actually 105 times in the New Testament with the meaning as that center of who we really are, the epicenter of our being. The biblical image is not the organ, the muscle, which pumps in our chest. It is with the heart that one can imagine. It is with the heart that one thinks. It is with the heart that one questions. It is with the heart that one believes. It is with the heart that one loves. When we in our modern times know the truth of the work of the heart, the physical work of the heart as being central, to the sustaining of life, it does fit well to use that as our metaphor, to believe as they did, that that is the center, the heart is the center of all that animates life and makes it precious. So, how about purity of heart? What does Jesus mean by that phrase in our scripture? In the New Testament, it is the Greek word katharos. You might hear again that it is the root to our words catharsis or cathartic. The releasing, those moments when we can release suppressed emotions. As the Greeks used that word in the time of Jesus, it meant clean and was used to describe the soiled laundry that had been washed or grain that had had the, remove, the chaff removed, or gold that had been refined of impurities. Pure in heart means without hypocrisy, open, nothing hidden, not attempting to appear to be something you are not. Those pure in heart are exactly what they appear to be. The scribes and the Pharisees in the time of Jesus had a serious heart problem. They seemed to have believed that as long as they fulfilled the law, as long as they followed the traditions, they were right before God. Many were sincere, and Jesus never condemned them for adhering to the law. What he condemned was when that careful obedience was done without a proper heart. It was a problem in the time of Jesus. It is a problem in our world today. What Jesus condemns the most are those who appear outwardly righteous to others, but inside are full of hypocrisy. Purity of heart of which Jesus speaks is a reminder that there needs to be this work that we do inside this transformation deep within, not only of what we do, but of who we are. Jesus is speaking about the heart of someone whose sins have been forgiven, whose heart has been made new, whose purity comes not from themselves, but from the presence of Jesus 
in their lives. So now we come to our third question this morning. What does it mean to see God? One aspect of which we are aware is our hope and assurance that we have been given eternal life and one day we will be face to face with God. That's one aspect of the answer to our question. But Jesus seems to be speaking about not just some future time, but what takes place now here on earth. We can recognize God's handprint in creation, but certainly that's not all Jesus is saying here. And it is not only about physical sight. Jesus also means mental and spiritual discernment or perception. We can use see in many similar ways. When we want someone to perceive what we are explaining, we say, can you see what I mean? When we want someone to understand something, we want them to see it clearly. When we want someone's will to change, we want them to see it our way. When we know that experience will help someone discern or understand, we prepare them for that experience by saying, just wait, you'll see. We are not saying that they will literally see, but they will understand. So the blessing here is this, a person who is pure in heart allows their life to be lost in Jesus and allows Jesus to live through them through their understanding, through their perception, their discernment of who God is, of God's ways, of God's will, of God's heart, and of God's hand. All of that will grow. They are able to see in God, see God in that they see the Spirit moving in the circumstances of their life, of our life. They are able to see God's will unfolding in their life, the provision that comes in the everyday, ordinary days of life. They are able to see God. Because God lives within, being revealed in new ways each and every day. The pure in heart will see God because they are living life filled with the Holy Spirit. So one time as an icebreaker at a church gathering, the question was asked, if you could have dinner with one person, living or dead, who would that be and why? So how would you have answered if you had been there? The answers, as you can imagine, were varied. Some even came as a great surprise. Through the answer and through the explanation as we sat together, we learned something about one another. You know, we have had heroes in our life. They're both male and female. Some came in our younger years when we looked up to someone. Oh, maybe it was even a singer, a rock star. Maybe it was even a movie star or a sports hero. And can you imagine, think back to that time, what would have happened if you actually met them? Been pretty amazing. And for some of you, you may still hold some of those from your earlier years as your heroes. Or it might be someone who changed the world in a significant way that makes a difference in your life. An inventor, an entrepreneur. Whatever you choose says a lot about what you value in another person. And not only that, but, but who you want to be. Well, at that time, in that church setting, I chose Abraham Lincoln. 
I admire his leadership style. He gathered a team of rivals in his government. Those who had opposed him all, the way, all along the way. He included them because he knew that they could make him better by not automatically agreeing with him and help him to see all sides. He also chose that style of leadership to hold a country together. One of my favorite stories in a book called Lincoln on Leadership is about how Abraham Lincoln would behave when he was angry, when he was frustrated, or maybe even hurt by some of the ways people treated him or talked about him or opposed him. What he would do was he would sit down and he'd write the nastiest letter he could think of. Put down all his anger, all his frustration, all his judgment. But he didn't mail it. What he would do is he'd put it in the drawer, and then when he'd cooled down, he would destroy it. It was through that that he could deal with these powerful emotions and not react and cause difficulty. I've always felt that I've learned a lot, even though I never got to meet him, never got to be a part of discussions. But he continues to be one of my heroes. We each have those who we admire. What we see in them are characteristics, skills, and abilities that we want, that we want to emulate. We want to be like them, or at least spend time with them to learn what we can. The higher we view someone, the higher we view them. The more we're going to allow them to direct and shape our lives. That which we admire, we desire to become more like. That which we esteem, we are willing to learn from. This is exactly what Jesus is speaking about and what we need to do to have purity of heart and to see God. When Jesus is the one that we view the highest, that is who we allow to direct and shape our lives. It is Jesus we will emulate. It is Jesus we will worship. The people who come closest to have purity of heart are those who have this total focus on Jesus, this laser focus. The hymns we sing, the one hymn that we sing, that I think comes the closest to saying that, asks us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, because when we do so, other claims will grow strangely dim. We then get to the singleness and wholeness of life, that makes for purity of heart. Seeing Jesus, we see God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When we come together in times of worship, we bring everything from life. We bring our struggles, we bring our celebrations, we bring our concerns, those things that trouble us during the day, those ways that we know of others who are hurting or ill, we bring those precious moments into times of prayer as well, as we give thanks to God for those moments that lift us in the time that we need it. We have mentioned the family of Marilyn Olson, we have mentioned Bryn. We continue to pray for continued healing for her. We pray for Junis Bryson, the work that the doctors and staff are doing to help her in reducing the pain that she is experiencing. And we continue in our prayers for Joanne Kozier, who is continuing to have good days to give thanks for. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are the church united as we pray from many different locations. 
connected through something more marvelous than technology, your spirit filling us with hope and vision. We come first of all with thanksgiving. Thank you for the many kindnesses we have experienced even in this time of social distancing. Old friends reconnecting, some households learning about togetherness, others learning quieter rhythms in life. Thank you for the joy of food and the beauty of music. Even as there is so much to be thankful for, we come together with lament. This virus has caused so much loss of life around the world. So many suffer, so many families grieve, and we don't know when it will end. We will lament the financial burdens of this pandemic and that it has fallen heavily on the poorest with inequalities standing out more sharply than usual. We know that racism is one of the roots of injustice, of everyday violence people of color face. There are those among us who suffer because of racism, and there are those among us who haven't thought about racism because it is a privileged air that we breathe. As we work on solving health problems, help us to build a society that addresses injustice. We continue to pray for a vaccine for this virus, give insight to the researchers, and cooperation among nations so that all can benefit from scientific breakthroughs. Give wisdom to our politicians making difficult decisions about how and when to modify social distancing. Help them find that fine balance between opening our economy and safeguarding our public health. Keep us healthy and help us care for one another. As we make choices about who to see and how many we should see at a time, help us refrain from judging each other just as we do not want to be judged by others. We pray also for the added burden in our country of these disasters, these fires that continue to rage and spread west of us, the people that are in long-term recovery from hurricanes and now see that there may be another coming to our shore. We pray for all people affected. Thank you for those who respond. Jesus, walk with us this week. We trust in you because you have always been with us, showing us the faithful path in good times and bad, and you will be with us, come what may. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God's teaching surrounds us. If you want to know love, to understand justice, or to embody wisdom, we must only pay attention. The gospel is always coming alive somewhere. For every new way God reaches to us, takes on flesh, and manifests within and around, let us bring our offerings with gratitude. Let us pray. Incarnate One, especially in these times of uncertainty, we hope to be companions of righteousness. We hope to divest from all that destroys. We hope we live, to live into the spirit of Christ that sets the captives free. With these offerings, we pray that our gratitude will be manifest in acts of radical love where and when they are needed most. Amen. Our closing hymn, Wherever you are, you are welcome to reflect or even sing, is Savior again to thy dear name.
Well, next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. Part of our worship, we will be lighting candles for those who have gone on to wait for us since All Saints last year. Just a reminder that next Sunday, remember to change your clocks. Receive this dismissal as you go forth. Blessed are the ones who are nourished by the gifts of heaven. Those who dwell in the lands of truth, reach for the ways of justice and seek the joy of collective liberation from generations of violence and domination. They are like trees planted by streams of water. With our hearts set upon the teachings of God, let us go and seek this transformation of grace. Amen.